uh, and just a little background um, about the open access policy um, that's in uh, the process of being drafted. So in March 2018, SUNY Chancellor Christina Johnson issued a resolution directing each SUNY campus to develop a campus-specific open access policy for faculty, student, and staff scholarship and creative works. Um, and that's pulled from the resolution that was out front, some of you may have picked up. Um, U Albany's provost subsequently charged the Libraries, Information Systems, and Computing Committee, which is also known as LISC, with drafting a policy in response to the Chancellor's call. Uh, because U Albany now has a draft policy, we are particularly excited to be hosting this Q&A session with some key participants in the policy's development. <laughs> Uh, to give you a little um, context for today's discussion, the policy applies to scholarly work that is content that authors create without the expectation of compensation. The policy prospectively applies a non-exclusive license to all work published at the institution which allows the university to distribute the work on the author's behalf openly. The author may choose to make the work available in New Albany's Scholars Archive, which, like I said, is our institutional repository or a disciplinary repository, and there is a no questions asked waiver um, option. So we'll discuss that a little bit more later. While we are envisioning this as open-ended Q&A about the policy, before we dive in, I wanted to introduce the group of folks that we have join, uh, joining us today. So we have Mark McBride, um, Mark McBride, a library senior strategist at SUNY's Office of Library and Information Services. Billy Francini, uh, director of the Institute for Teaching, Learning, and Academic Leadership at UAlbany, and former chair of LISC. And we have Jerry, I'm going to mispronounce. Marshke. Marshke, okay. An associate professor in the Department of Economics. Thank you all for participating today. Um, as I mentioned, we plan to keep this as an informal discussion Q&A, but we'll start with some remarks from everyone to learn about their experience and a little bit of background um, about themselves and the development of the policy. So I guess we'll kick it off with Mark, if that's okay. Sure. So Mark, in your role at OLIS, um, could you give us some information about the directive at the SUNY level? For example, perhaps some back history of the Chancellor's memo, goals of the directive, vision for open access across SUNYs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, good afternoon, everyone. I think it's a good idea to always start with the culprit. Um, and so the SUNY system did pass this resolution uh, through the SUNY Board of Trustees in 2018. Uh, the SUNY Board of Trustees actually uh, received a recommendation previous to this resolution passed uh, in 2017 from the SUNY University Faculty Senate. The SUNY University Faculty Senate asked the Board of Trustees and the Chancellor at that time, Nancy Zimber, um, to consider an open access policy or an open access resolution uh, that could be applied to all SUNY campuses. Previous to that, in 2000. 15, there was a group um, out of the University Faculty Senate um, that wrote a resolution and that passed as well uh, that asked the University Faculty Senate to look at open access repositories and how open access repositories and open access scholarship could uh, support faculty in their research endeavors. So that, that's kind of the history behind it. Um, where I sit in my office, um, I currently oversee the Office of Library and Information Services. Um, part of that portfolio includes the Open Educational Resources Area. Uh, and also part of my responsibility is to uh, develop a plan for how we're going to help campuses support their open access activities post their own local policies being implemented. Um, so we're looking at different repository environments. We're probably going to start with a phased approach um, where we're going to introduce a, a new repository environment. Uh, it's built on DSpace, but it's a, it's a kind of a, a souped up version. Um, we're going to use a, a product called Open Repository that all campuses will have access to free of charge initially. 
Um, hopefully we can keep that uh, cost low or, or, or maintain free access for all campuses without having to charge. Um, but it all depends on, on, on usage and, and how much data is actually going into the repository. But we're also looking at different uh, aspects of what we're referring to as the research life cycle or the research workflow. Um, we know that a lot of the publishers in this space now, you know, Elsevier, Wiley, Springer, and others, you know, they've kind of shifted their focus to be more about data than actual publishing. In fact, I think they refer to themselves as data companies or, or ed tech companies now than outright just as publishers. This is following the same logic and the, the same way that the textbook industry has kind of shifted their priorities away from just publishing traditional textbooks. I mean, they still do that. They still make an awful lot of money off of it. But they're also producing a lot of ancillary materials, like uh, you know, uh, homework uh, systems that, that, that help faculty um, you know, introduce different topics to students and also help uh, the students be able to you know, move through their education experience in more of a digital fashion than just direct text-based uh, homework or uh, content. Uh, situations. So as we're watching the publishers transition, we're figuring we need to start transitioning our own thinking. Um, and in transitioning our own thinking, we're looking at, uh, we're looking broadly across the university system at not only our research centers, but also at system administration of what capacity we have internally to support these initiatives and these activities as we move forward. You know, we have a university press, the SUNY University Press. Um, so we're looking at the SUNY Press and we're thinking, you know, what role do they play in the future of, of open access publishing and open access scholarship? You know, we're looking at the Office of Library and Information Services, the, you know, the office I, I, I reside in. You know, what do we put in place to help support campuses and help support faculty as they start moving into this? new open access uh, arena. And, and to be honest with you, at this time, we don't have all the answers. We rely on a lot of the expertise, some of it that's sitting in this room right now, to kind of guide us through this. Um, but what, one thing we do know is that we are confident that the future is open. Now, that doesn't mean the future is free, because you know, open doesn't equal free. You know, I always say open is free is like, uh, like a puppy is free. Um, mine ran away this morning at 6.30 in the morning. I'll let you know a little uh, He's back, though, after he met all his new neighbors. Um, <laughs> there's always cost to publishing open, and there's always cost to maintaining this scholarship, and there's always cost in producing this scholarship. And so we have to put that in the forefront as we start to think about what open ecosystem we want to develop to support our faculty. Thank you, Mark. Now, if you could um, talk a little bit about your role with LISC um, at the time of the OA Policy Working Group's inception, and maybe you could give us a sense of what the process looked like, how you solicited um, members from across the disciplines, and how the charge shaped our efforts, and maybe how some of those early conversations unfolded. So as you mentioned, in spring 2018, this directive came to campuses from SUNY. Um, and Karen Reinhold, who was then chair of the Senate, reached out to me and said, this sounds like a LISC project. Um, I engaged in some conversations with the provost's office, and the provost at that time was Jim Steller, and he agreed that this sounded like a reasonable task for LISC to take on. Um, because of when because of when the flow of information was happening, LISC was kind of at the end of our work for that academic year. So I made LISC members aware that we had been charged with drafting this policy. Um, and we actually didn't really take up the work until the following fall. Um, Senate councils typically don't meet in the summer because you're still kind of transitioning membership. So in fall 2018, in our initial meeting, I was continued as chair of LISC in that year. Um, and had a conversation with that council about who should um, serve on a working group to actually draft a policy. Um, and the agreement among the list was there's a lot of expertise that we need involved in drafting this policy that doesn't sit on this council. <laughs> so we started making some decisions about where would we like to have people, people come from. 
Um, and so we agreed that we needed representation from the university libraries. Um, we needed representation of faculty from a variety of disciplinary backgrounds because publishing works differently in different disciplines. Data works differently in different disciplines. Um, and so we would need that kind of breadth of perspective to help us um, make a decision that would, would actually um, would, would represent multiple con uh, constituencies of the university. Um, we agreed that we wanted someone from the Division of Research um, to serve on the working group. So as, as LISC kind of made those um, decisions, I started reaching out to faculty, to administrators, um, and, and seeking recommendations for people to serve on this working group. Uh, our first working group meeting was in the fall of 2018, I think in early November. Um, we had an initial meeting and kind of started brainstorming how we wanted to do our work, what needed to be done, um, and part of the decision we made at that time was to have two subgroups because the directive from SUNY actually has two parts, right? There's the, the campuses has, have been charged with drafting and implementing an open access policy, but also with instituting a repository, an open repository. Um, so we actually decided to divide into two subgroups, a repository group and a policy group. Um, and also after that initial meeting, Matt Ingram graciously stepped forward and agreed um, that he would stand as chair of the working group and he was, we had an election and the next meeting was all very democratic. Um, <laughs> but at that point then he kind of took charge of that process and also chaired the um, policy development subgroup of, of the working group and Lenore Horowitz at that time stepped forward and agreed to chair the repository subgroup of the working group. Um, what has happened since then, since that point, we have actually drafted a policy in the policy subgroup that has been shared with the policy group. Um, the repository subgroup has met and, and you know, kind of thought about what are the implications of the, both the um, repository part of the directive, but also the policy itself, what are the implications for that on Scholar's Archive, um, on resources, for both within the library and on faculty resources. Um, so those conversations have kind of been ongoing. Um, at this point, we have a draft policy that has been sent to the provost office, and we're awaiting feedback from the provost office with the intent of presenting the draft policy to the University Senate this semester. Um, so that the campus community has the opportunity to, to give feedback through the Senate. Uh, we also hosted an open forum last Thursday, which was another opportunity to kind of make the university community aware that this policy is in development and to seek feedback. So we're kind of in the stage right now of, of trying to help people across the university see that this is coming, but also give them the opportunity to share feedback on a draft before it's actually finalized and implemented. Thank you, Billy. And um, now, Jerry, if we were hoping you could share a little bit about your um, perspective and participation as a faculty member who has had a little skeptical, healthy skepticism <laughs> about the OA policy. Um, but if you could share with us your, your takeaways from our discussion, hopes, and concerns um, about the policy, that'd be great. Oh, okay, I could go on about this, but I'll, so we, maybe some of this will sort of emerge, you know, you know the questions and so yeah. forth. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I consider myself kind of the Joe Blow faculty member representative on this committee. I don't have, you know, any strong ideological perspective uh, or, 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 or too much uh, in terms of, uh, you know, preformed assumptions about open access. Uh, I am also interested in the scientific enterprise is sort of a research question. So my uh, research is on science, I think the economics of science, and I work a lot with publication data, and um, I, you know, this is one way in which I track, for example, the productivity of scientists and so forth, mostly academic scientists is, uh, with publications. So I have lots of experience, um, or at least some experience, negotiating with some of these uh, publishers for data access, and I know uh, from that experience how difficult that is and how intransigent they can be and how, uh, how much they, uh, you know, how dearly you can pay for access to uh, what, some, you know, what some people think should be uh, open and avail freely available. Now, this is an important, of course, 
um, characteristic of science, you know, openness and sharing, science progresses. Now, that's a perspective I take. I know there's a humanities perspective too, but the, uh, the scientific notion of openness is a very important. Uh, science does not progress without uh, scientists being able to meet each other's work. So, so you know, that's my interest. And in, uh, generally, and, and then um, my role, I thought my role in the committee, and I, I thought the committee worked very well, it functioned extremely well in crafting this policy is, is to represent the interests, especially of junior faculty, in making sure that uh, whatever open access policy we formulated didn't impinge on it in any way, you know, on their ability to publish wherever they thought they needed to publish in order to advance their career. And uh, the other concern that I thought I brought to the committee too was one of costs. Very concerned about costs. Uh, we just got an email from Todd Foreman. I don't know if you saw that a couple weeks ago. Ours was one of the five uh, faculty uh, uh, searches that was canceled. And uh, we've had a lot of trouble, um, you know, maintaining a PhD program with the cuts that have been made. Um, the cuts that have been made to uh, our stipends. And we have trouble retaining faculty members who get offers elsewhere because uh, we can't meet the salary offers. And so, one concern I have, and I always have this concern, regardless of the subject matter, is you know how much do these new proposals cost in terms of administration and uh, sort of library staff, and how we allocate our time and uh, the opportunity cost and all that. So that's what I think I brought to the policy, uh, uh, the uh, proposals, production, and I think the the resolution in the end, uh, I. I view it, at least as it stands now, is not terribly costly. I think that there are costs involved, but uh, it could be a lot worse, in my view. The benefits, I think, uh, to an open access policy are, in my view, uh, still uncertain. Because we all, as scientists, and uh, even in the humanities, have a very strong, you know, uh, if we're interested in pursuing our careers, having a career in our fields, we have a strong incentive to uh, publish and disseminate already. So uh, that, that to me is an open question. Open access to me is an open question still as to what its value is. Uh, but I haven't made up my mind about that yet. But I think the way the resolution stands now is it's fairly innocuous. By my calculation, it probably is only going to cost us uh, at most, given the fact that we have about 600, uh, you know, 600 publishing faculty, full-time faculty, tenure-track faculty on campus, you know, at most it's going to cost us 10 to 20 minutes a person a year, maybe 100 or 200 hours collectively, uh, which is still a lot of time, um, but uh, hopefully the benefits outweigh those costs, and uh, there may be some benefits here. I can see some benefits in terms of. Uh, you know, other universities in developing countries in particular that can't afford the subscription prices that our university can. And they will have access now to publications that they wouldn't have access otherwise. Although I think the, the returns to them even are rather modest too. We'll talk about that. And then uh, there are, you know, non-practitioners and lay people and policy makers and so forth that may have access to the margin that they wouldn't have otherwise. <coughs> That's my perspective. Thank you. So, um, it's a little bit about our panel and a little bit about um, the development of the policy. So we'll open it up to you all for your questions that you might have. Go for it. Um, Jerry, go ahead and sip your coffee. Um, <laughs> I didn't do that on purpose. Uh, so you came up with a figure of 15 to 20 minutes per faculty member, and that's time to do what exactly? Oh, so my idea is it would take me 10 minutes, because I've got to track down the, I got to track down the, um, the file. So you know how it works. So the open access policy resolution that it stands says that it encourages faculty or requires a fact, that's a little bit unclear as to exactly what the incentives will be in the end and what the penalties will be in the end, but. What you're supposed to do at the time of publication is you're supposed to uh, send uh, your publication. You're going to have to find the file and send it to uh, the library. And I don't know how that's going to be done. 
the alternative to that is that you uh, submit a form, uh, uh, a waiver, which is granted automatically, but you still have to file file the form. So based on that, you know, I don't know how much time it's going to take. It depends. I mean, all my interfaces with the university, and you know, if I want to, you know, if I want to, for example, uh, request an interlibrary loan. Although this has gotten a lot better uh, uh, in the last three or four years. You know, it takes me about ten minutes. There are certainly other open access journals that charge fees to keep them open, and uh, oftentimes universities pick up those costs. Uh, that's something that probably needs to be discussed here. Uh, also be aware that the university libraries does pay uh, uh, for the, uh, the platform for a scholar's archive. So that's another cost that needs to be considered. Exactly. If you look at the and by, sort of and some of the in my, in my discussions with Lindsay, I got the impression that although again we don't know how much demand is going to be placed on scholars' archives, this is one way in which to meet the requirements in the policy. You know, is to uh, submit your. But if you can show that it's submitted elsewhere, right. so that's then that's point. another way to satisfy that. That's true. But this may put an added burden on the whole scholars' archive thing, and then you know we might need staff or large scholars archive in some way or increase its functionality in some ways. We I would know. like that, I Lindsay, think, in the libraries. We would like we would like I know that you traffic. would like that. We but there's like an that, opportunity right? cost to all these kinds of budgetary right. allocations. Absolutely. And I'm concerned about the opportunity cost to the mission of the university, which I, as I see is teaching and research. Uh, now libraries I'm sure think of themselves as being, you know, they're facilitating teaching and research. There are these other concerns I have. Jody? This is a cross SUNY question. Um, because it's been about 18 months since the Chancellor's uh, memo has come out, what's, every SUNY is different, but with that in mind, um, do other SUNYs have policies in place yet? And if so, does anyone know what the outcome has been? given that not a very long period of time has passed. Sure, so, um, and just to, to clarify, so that resolution that the board passed only applies to state operating campuses, so community colleges were excluded from this. Uh, however, we have we are seeing some of our community colleges um, develop and implement open access policies as a result of this uh, resolution. So previous to um, the resolution actually being passed, Stony Brook University had an open access policy. They were the first one out of the gate, so to speak. Um, soon after that, Brockport followed. Then the policy came out, uh, the resolution came out, mandating the policies be created at the state operated campuses. To my knowledge right now, I think there are maybe four or five campuses that have completed their policy work. Um, and everybody's in development in different levels of that of that process right um, and the the question that keeps getting brought up um, to my office and I also think to the to the library community especially the director community is you know should we implement open access policies that are opt-in or opt-out um, and so opt-in is, is that it's a, a policy that's on the books but faculty can choose not to participate um, and in fact, if you want to participate, you opt in to participate. You say, yes, I will participate in this policy. While other campuses are implementing policies that are opt out. That means a faculty member is obligated to participate, but if they decide they don't want to, they just have to simply opt out. And there's, there, there is enough difference in those two uh, uh, policies that I think campuses have to really focus on because to me, an open, and, and this is just me personally, an opt-in policy really is not a policy, so to speak, uh, where I think an opt-out policy really is more of a, a policy that faculty can react to. Um, again, at the end of the day, any policy that talks about the research endeavors or has our faculty to participate in any type of um, you know, workflow, additional workflow or additional capacity activity that's going to maybe take you know 20 minutes per year per faculty member, whatever the, the numbers are that you quoted, Jerry. I mean, we have to consider all that. Um, the other piece of this pie that I think we have to consider about, and then just taking more like a 30,000 foot view, 
historically, I think what libraries have done, and I don't think anybody's been quite aware of this other than libraries because they have to suffer through this, as traditional publishers have kind of increased their, their, their costs, they've kind of sucked up the whole open access publishing space. So one of the top publishers actually in open access is Elsevier. Um, so in order for libraries to make, let's say, good on uh, purchasing content, like through Elsevier or Wiley, other publishers, they've had to take money, they've had to shift money away from other areas like personnel to pay for acquisitions. Um, and, and, and that has been a real, it has had a negative impact on library and their staff. And I think if you talk to your library, they are heavily committed to the research and teaching initiatives on campus, and they feel they are at the heart of that mission. Um, and they have had to maybe suffer through a time where publishers have um, placed them in a position where they can no longer afford to do business uh, and, and the terms that are being kind of laid or placed upon them by the publishers. I know that was more than you asked for, but I had to get it off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I will just add in terms of our um, actual policy development here at UAlbany, we did use Stony Brook's policy as one model, I, I wouldn't say a model, but as one model that we that we kind of looked at. Um, as, as, as you've heard described, I think in, in what Jerry was saying, we are looking at an opt-out model, um, which is um, faculty are expected to uh, comply, but there's a no questions asked waiver. It's not quite sure how that policy, or not quite clear how that's going to be enforced at this point. Like, what is the, <laughs> what is your incentive to comply besides goodwill? Um, but that's kind of the, the policy that we're working with. The other detail, which I'm not sure has come up yet, um, the the directive had a deadline of March 2020 for policies to be implemented. So um, that's one of the reasons why we're trying to get this before the Senate fairly soon so that there's a lot of opportunity for feedback. Um, that's, you know, we're, we're still trying to get feedback from the provost office also. Um, but we're looking at a fairly tight timeline to actually have this policy in place. Yeah, I had a question for Mark, just um, two, two things that caught my attention were the shift away from the current repository framework towards open repository, and I was wondering if you could say more about that. Um, sure. And then I had another question, and you mentioned Elsevier, so I'm, I'm curious about the complementarities between promoting uh, a culture of openness generally on campus, including open access, and how that might interact with other um, other things that are going on with Elsevier, including I just got an email in my inbox today about an update regarding the negotiations, the SUNY-wide negotiations with Elsevier, and so you mentioned the amount of control that commercial companies have over even library acquisitions and, and, and their, their negotiating leverage or their leverage during negotiations. So I think at one point, Elsevier owned the underlying software that, that, that is the framework for Scholar's Archive. Am I correct about that? No, that they owned, oh, they did? Oh, I didn't know Elsevier, that. I didn't know they did. Elsevier bought B-Press in 2007. B-Press, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So in, just to join these two questions, like in a way moving towards open repository, which was, I see it was, I just looked them up, and they, they, were, public, they were purchased by a Belgian company from Springer, Nature, at another sort of commercial giant. Mm -hmm. So that seems to, in some ways, move away from Elsevier, which might provide some le leverage in negotiations with Elsevier elsewhere. But in whatever order you'd like to answer those, like, I'm curious about open repository and why the move to open repository, and then I'm, okay. I'm curious about the broader picture. So um, in terms of the Elsevier negotiation, I'll be honest with you, um, because this is being recorded and because we're in the middle of the negotiation, I'm not going to address anything specific. I'm happy to talk to you afterwards, and Mary's on the negotiation team with me, and Rebecca's in the room, so we can field a lot of those questions. I think, um, I mean, I could say that, you know, Elsevier has purchased um, some of the open access footprint. Um, that at one time was, you know, it wasn't freely available because there was always a cost to it, but it, 
I would say that um, a lot of the open access initiatives were really formed through small companies or through community efforts. And then a lot of these companies stepped in and they started purchasing uh, and acquiring a lot of these um, open access platforms, let's say. Um, now, to your the question about the repository, why would one want open repository? Um, and I'll tell you, this is possibly one of the most um, uh, least controversial responses I can give to you. So we have DSpace, which is owned by Atmire, and that's the company we work with. We have them on contract, and DSpace is going to stay present. We're going to keep that repository up and running and functioning. Uh, about 40 or 50 of our campuses are currently using it. Atmire also has open repository. And so because we already have a contract with them, and because we have a tight timeline, uh, timeline, you know, March uh, 2020, where this is uh, has to be implemented for all our campuses, we want to make sure the pro uh, the repository is actually in place as these policies hit the street, so to speak, and as we reach that deadline. Going through the New York State procurement process and the SUNY procurement process, it takes a long time, um, and uh, at this at this juncture, we're not ready to go down that road. That's why we're saying this is more of a phased approach, man. So, you know, we're looking at open repositories being like the first um, phase in building a, an open ecosystem, so to speak. You know, that's why we're kind of keeping our eyes down the road to see, you know, what else is out there that we should be considering for future work with our faculty, you know, whether, where their scholarship is concerned, where their publishing is concerned. We think that open access is more than just a repository, and we know that more than a repository is going to um, be needed to support that research activity. Um, and so what we want to understand before we start making any decisions is what are the needs of our university centers? And do the university centers need our support? Uh, what are the needs of our doctoral campuses and our comprehensive schools and our colleges of technology and our community colleges? And what do we need to put in place to support them? Um, and honestly, you know, where, where most of the scholarship is created is at the university centers and the doctorals. So we may have to follow their lead uh, instead of like providing a, a, a steadfast vision of the direction we should be going in. In fact, it would probably be better for us and a more pragmatic option to follow um, the direction that our university centers uh, put in place and support them where we can. Um, and uh, as we start to build this future, build it together instead of building in silos or in isolation from one another. Thank you. Well, you know, I, could I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. All right, because this is, this, I've been wanting to ask you this, Billy. <laughs> the conversations you're having in the development of the policy, what are the top concerns that the faculty are expressing? Um, economic concerns. What, what, are the, what, what are the resources that are going to be required to keep, um, to adhere to a policy? Um, I think there is, one of the big concerns that came out in early conversations uh, about the policy itself was time on the part of faculty members. Um, I know we've had some conversations recently about research versus data, and we've decided the policy will only focus on research and publishing. Jerry, you probably have a more to consider also. Yeah, I thought that the biggest concern, and it's not founded, uh, is that this is going to restrict where folks can publish their work. Yes, that was an initial. Mm -hmm. But after that, yeah. It's right, right. And the answer to that is no. Respect. No, no. Now, now, you could worry that this is the camel's nose, which is a concern of mine. Mm -hmm. But I think that would just it would just get so much uh, resistance that it, it would not fly. The university would cease to exist at that point. Well, and I think that's the interesting dilemma that we're facing with open access because you know the publishers who do own this footprint, so to speak. You know, they add great value 
and the, the scholarly activities of our faculty. I mean, every faculty member who, who produces research or produces scholarship wants to publish in the top tier journals. I mean, they want to be recognized as the tops in their field, and we should never stand in the way of that. Um, and these journals are, are, are tops for, for very good reason. There'll be some good research and good scholarship being created um, and published within those journals. Um, but the question is, you know, how do we financially keep the publishers in place and how do we financially keep this, you know, fragile house of cards intact while also making it accessible to, you know, populations of people that you were talking about, you know, the people in the sub-Saharan who cannot get access to latest scholarship on, like, malaria cures or, or what about the citizens of New York State who aren't SUNY students and can't get access to the abundance of resources that we have inside of our libraries and on our campuses? I mean, there, you know, there's a hearts and minds argument that has to be to be weighed in as much as the financial and the business implications of it. And I think, you know, this this is a time where we really have to think in terms of what we want to see built for a future how we can afford it and what's the, the mission of the university and the uni and the mission of really society where education is concerned. And I think we can I think and there are other people in the room who are in those in those meetings who can confirm that at least our first two meetings as a working group were very much focused on people's concerns. <laughs> and there was this um, you know and, and I think that was actually really necessary. I think that needed to be surfaced and discussed and addressed. Um, because there's this tension between kind of the hearts and minds we want to do the right thing and we are a financially strapped institution um, that has to make strategic decisions in order to keep ourselves afloat right and so I think that tension was was very much at the heart of the early conversations around the development of the policy um, so the first at least the first two meetings I would say were very much airing of concerns and not a lot of policy development yet. But I think that really had to happen before we could get to, okay, now <laughs> now that we know what everyone is concerned about and now that we know what we're really trying to aim for, now we're ready to start talking about what a policy would actually look like for us. Um, I'll ask a question. So, um, and we've hinted at it a little bit, but I don't know if there's been some hints of it, but um, so what are the benefits of having a policy like this? Maybe you can answer it from um, Mark, the SUNY level, like where did it start? Like, oh, this is a thing we should do, sort right. of thing. And so um, maybe it could be answered at that level, but also what would, what are the benefits of UAlbany, to UAlbany, or maybe it's even just academies overall for having an open access policy. Sure, so I mean, just again, to go uh, through the history a little bit, you know, the University Faculty Senate, the SUNY University Faculty Senate asked for the Board of Trustees to consider this policy. Um, but it wasn't like the University Faculty Senate asked for this and the Board didn't want to listen. You know, they were eager to react to this, uh, especially the Chancellor, uh, uh, Christina Johnson. So. You know, what we understand about open access is that it actually increases readability for our faculty, which we think is important. Um, also, you know, we publicly fund a lot of research, uh, as does the federal government and many foundations. Um, and there's requirements with a lot of that money that the scholars should be openly available. Um, I would say that, you know, for me personally, when I first um, started um, let's say connecting myself to open access and, and open educational resources, what they refer to as the open movement, um, I was mainly focused on just being opposed to the publishers and the way they have, let's say, uh, practice, their business practices. Um, after a time, you know, you get to really understand the industry and you realize that while they provide great value, because I'm not going to take on that work, uh, and you know I don't want to see our libraries have to take on that role of being the publisher. Um, but I think there also has to be some sort of pragmatic uh, understanding on our part as much as on their part, where you know institutions are financially strapped. I mean, it's not just 
University of Albany or institutions in New York, it's well documented that higher education is facing an affordability crisis. Um, and I think publishers have to recognize that and understanding that they're in the they're in the practice of making money, and I don't think they should not be for-profit institutions. I believe for-profit space is important, and I think it needs to be, you know, remain a strong foothold in uh, the development of, of open scholarship moving forward. With that said, I also think there has to be a time where the publishers begin to recognize that it isn't like it was 20 or 30 years ago. The, 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 the funding is just not there as it once was. Our libraries are strapped, our campuses are strapped, our families are no longer can afford education at the, at the current uh, rate. And so those are all things that have to be considered because we're all in this together, so to speak. Uh, so we have to find a solution that benefits them financially but also benefits us and our mission, uh, which is you know to educate the citizens of New York and, and the world. talking about this, just an interesting research, I'll give you an example. So uh, there's this paper uh, by uh, Patrick Gall, who's uh, an economist, uh, I can't remember, it's, it's Canadian University, I can't remember which one it is, but he did this interesting study where he looked at um, uh, university subscription uh, access to, you know, Elsevier and the other big science publishers, and and uh, what papers um, scholars in uh, India, I forget what the other country was, uh, India was one of them. These poor universities in developing countries, you know, access to uh, scholarship, how important is it? So it turns out, yeah, so when the university subscribes to Elsevier and now, and now researchers at the university has access to this body of research, this body of research gets cited more, suggesting greater spillovers, you know, more access means, you know, more science. Uh, that's an interesting result, but the increase in citation rates, if you take that as a proxy for spillovers, just very modest. And so he followed up with another paper to find out why it was so small. And it turns out that faculty, if they're interested in a subject, have ways of obtaining copies of science. So I think, you know, partly when, when there's a will, there's a way, when there's a need, you know, you'll find a ways around the paywall. So that uh, that's one reason why I'm highly skeptical that this open access policy extent that it actually bites. It's not sure how I'm not sure how it's gonna bite. It's gonna increase, you know, our visibility or uh, the degree to which we're able to disseminate our research. Um, there's a there's a whole literature on this this subject. It turns out that there isn't much research done on on subscriptions and open access and the impact of that on you know, the dissemination of science, but there's a related literature Happy to tell you about. But my, my sense is that the effects will be marginal. So I focus on the cost. Now it turns out that you know a lot of this is going to be borne by the library, and a lot of this is going to be borne, some of it's going to be borne by the provost office. We're seeing this now. We're all sitting here. Presumably we have other things that we could be doing. Uh, I note, and uh, I mean no offense to the library, that we have a very high library staff to full full time uh, uh, faculty ratio here, um, and I don't think this is going to shrink that relative to the other university centers. And so, and we have a high ratio of uh, non instructional staff to faculty staff, so I don't think this is going to shrink that. And I'm not picking on this policy. This policy may have a marginal effect on all of these things, but policies that are accumulating, I mean, in the last 15 or 20 years that I've been here, you know, these kinds of policies go up to the Senate, they get passed. I have no idea what happens, but I just noticed that our uh, administrator to faculty ratio is going up, and, you know, our ability to run uh, our departments is going down. So that's why I'm so focused on the cost. I wonder if we make um, open access and, and 
are making it more of a thing, like this is what we do, perhaps if we know better where people are getting their information without the paywall, we could perhaps better measure the impact of the research. So we're not capturing something, right? Because people are getting it another way, whether it be open access or their colleagues. So yeah. that's a story. So I, I feel as though um, if, if we know what mechanisms people are using, we can then look at what is being used and better impact or better measure that impact. So that helps complete the story. So citations counts tell one story, one side of the story. But if, um, if, if we know better where, so if, if people are depositing in repositories, which a lot of faculty are already doing this, but if we can know collectively where, right, then we can sort of track well, who's, who's using that information, and then we can better tell the story of the impact coming from the university. So uh, maybe that would help complete the picture. And then we can better say, like, this is the impact that you all have having in these areas. Yeah, that kind of study would be useful. Yeah. So I'm saying, you're saying there's not a lot of research out there, but perhaps it's just hard to attain the, the data. Mm -hmm. So perhaps a policy like this would help us attain that, because now it's, you don't have to do it behind closed doors. And where we're, uh, the university is you know, taking a stronger stance with the publishers. Publishers don't want you to know how, how to share information either. So now we don't have to do it behind closed doors. Yeah, I, you know, working with OER, you know, looking at a lot of the, the foundational research in that space, I mean, I'll be honest with the early research in OER, and I don't mean to offend anybody, um, but I think you could probably dismiss almost all the early research, uh, because there's no theoretical framework. I mean, it was all, um, it was all really based on um, what OER is doing in a particular class after one semester or after two semesters. And you know, these things you have to track over time, right? And so what I'm interested in is you're looking at research and open access. I mean, what theoretical frameworks are people putting into place when they actually research open access? I mean, is there like behavioral economics that play into this? I mean, what are some of the foundational research we could point to to help better understand the impact open access could have? You asking me? Yeah, because I don't have the answer. I figured you do. Uh, I don't have the answer to you. I, I mean, I, this is not my area of open access. I just looked at the literature, so I kind of skimmed the literature. And I mean, the problem often is one of, you know, what the statisticians call identification. You're trying to identify yeah. some treatment effect here, but you don't have a good control group. So it's really hard to learn anything from this. So there is a large literature, but I'm just focusing on the literature, which I, you know, I, I can believe. There's a very small literature, which I can. I've looked at the open education research literature too, and I completely agree with you. Most of it you can discount. I think, and I looked at it pretty thoroughly, so I feel a little bit more confident about that. There's very little experimental evidence, uh, you know, or they had a, a sound identification strategy. And the experimental evidence that I've seen is on small, very small samples, so uh, the power of that, you know, statistical test over time. So, uh, that is an open area for re research, both of them. I think they're wide open. We don't know. We just don't know. But I know from my perspective, there's just, uh, from you know, most of my colleagues, there's many places where we you know, put our work. And the way economics works is that there's a four or five year gestation. This isn't true of this, the hard sciences, but in economics, there's a four or five year gestation. You know, meanwhile, there are versions of your paper that's in circulation. By the time the paper finally gets published in a journal, it's behind a paywall. It's old news. Nobody cares about it. So uh, I don't think that's true of the biomedical sciences, which I'm very familiar with. It's, uh, you know, papers are being produced very quickly and published. It doesn't go through kind of a working paper and circulation phase. So this is more important. But there are places where you can put these things, you know, still. In physics, there's Archive X. Uh, you have your networks. You know, people are obtaining their uh, so sometimes, occasionally, I get an email from some layperson or somebody from a you know a developing country. It looks like a researcher who may not have access via a subscription. Of say, can you send me a paper? Yeah, I can send you a paper. And I send. Probably not supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
we have time for one more question, if there are any. I guess not. So I guess we'll conclude. So thank you for coming and sharing with the group. And uh, there's still snacks in the back, and there's coffee, so please help yourself. And thank you for coming.